they suddenly said everybody had to go organic, we'd have to get 5% of the population to come back to the farm because we'd have to have so much more hand labor that would have to go out there at the very minimum. Now, if people want to have the organic, once again, it's a free economy. If they're willing to pay for it and it means that much to them, it's kind of like the non-GMO. I am completely supportive of, of people, you know, promoting that. Do you have experience growing organic food? I mean, I know that... I was certified organic and part of our operation for three years. Oh, oh, eight, oh, nine, oh, ten, I think, somewhere in there. So I have a general uh, familiarization with organic standards. Because I know there's a huge misconception. I talk about this all the time about organic not using pesticides. Well, of course they use pesticides. They just use organically approved ones. And some of them, I, I used one, I was doing organic tobacco at the time <laughs> for Santa Fe. So you've probably seen them in the stores of anybody that, that's organic tobacco cigarettes. I used a pesticide that has skull and crossbones on it, which is the most potent level of warning on a pesticide. But it's quote organic. Because it's naturally derived. Right. So they're natural, they're, all, they're natural poisons all through the environment. What they're doing is they're going to find those and trying to use them. And that's fine. I mean, but you know, there are some things like uh, potassium sulfate, I think it what it was. Anyway, it's 0052. You could use that fertilizer if it was mined, because it was a naturally occurring mineral. But if they manufactured it, the exact same molecular formula, if they manufactured it, you couldn't use it. Now, that to me is absurd. You know, if you're actually talking about what goes into the crop. I think the bigger picture was they didn't like the idea that chemical operations, and so it was a philosophy there as well. So part of the organic standards really or more hoops that you're jumping through. Uh, so yes, there are pesticides that are used. The toxin that is in uh, GMO insect resistant crops is essentially the same toxin in the BT toxin that are, is, is approved for organic production. Now the difference is when you spray it on the surface of the leaf to kill the insects, you wash it off in the GMOs, it's actually in the cells, so you're ingesting much more of it. That's another one that uh, that is interesting. I'm, like I said, I said earlier, I'm not anti-technology. I just think we need to have smart technology and we need to think about the results of what we're doing. And just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. We don't want to try to feed ourselves with 19th century technology. That just doesn't make any sense. You can't be entirely anti-science. Not realistic, it's not smart. But we can manage it. We can be smart about how we use it. We can choose what we decide to use. And I don't think we've done a very good job of that. I think there's a big movement, and I don't think a lot of these people are anti-science necessarily, but because they're really into the biology side of it. Mm -hmm. But you're, I think you're more talking about like technology mm -hmm. and, and, and equipment and stuff like that. Well, right? that and, and the way we breed, the, you know, traditional breeding and so forth. I mean, once again, I do run into people who, who equate hybrid corn with GMO corn, and they're just not even anywhere in the same, in two entirely different subjects. And people need to be educated about that. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the struggles for farmers nowadays? And I know you mentioned this before with profitability mm -hmm. and regulation in terms of like gap certification and things that make it harder for farmers to grow. Number one is the economic part of it. It's, it's increasingly difficult to find capital. Capital both for, for like land and equipment. Equipment's not so much because people, it's like buying cars. You know, they throw them at people. You can buy all the tractors you want, but you can quite often, in order to get a finance, you'll pay for something way more expensive than you need. But operating capital is probably the single biggest issue because it's hard. It takes a lot of money to buy the inputs to grow it. Whether you're putting up on a small scale, when you put up high tunnels, or when you put over plastic mulching and your drip lines and the equipment to do that, and when you're buying seeds and whatever fertilizer, all that takes cash that you've got to put out that you won't get a return on for 60 days to a year, depending on what you're growing, or longer if you're, if you're talking about a multi-year crop. So trying to find capital availability and capital that you can afford is a true challenge. And I've heard people say it's easier to borrow a million dollars than it is to borrow a thousand. And I've come to believe that's pretty much true. You know, on a small scale, it's hard to secure loans. It's hard for banks to feel comfortable, especially on operating money, because there's nothing there for them to come and feel like they can, then they know they can come and get their money back. So that's always been a challenge. It was very, very difficult when we were in the dairy business. Half your investment was in livestock. Nobody wanted to lend money for cows. You know, you got a good Holstein cow that would cost $1,500. Nobody wanted to lend money for it. 
And that's half the cost of getting into the dairy business. And that, that was crippling for us when we were trying to get into it. So because people would go ahead and finance it, but they wanted to finance it over two or three years. And there's not that kind of profitability to pay for that. In terms of regulations, I don't, I'm not really feeling oppressed by the regulations too much. But pesticide regulations can become burdensome. That can be a real pain, and you know what? Uh, and some of the larger farms have to actually hire somebody just to do that for them. And that's, that's a dead expense. That's an additional expense of whatever you're putting out there. So there are some regulations there. The water regulations can be, can be annoying sometimes to keep you doing what you want to do. When we were in the dairy business, we had the waste management regulations. We kind of got pushed, pulled into it by the swine industry who brought it on themselves as far as I'm concerned, by and large. In the produce business, I think we mentioned and talked about GAP certification. The GAP certification comes from FSMA, which is the Food Safety Modernization Act. Most farmers who are growing produce are not required by law to be GAP certified. It's a, it's a pretty high threshold of gross income, like $100,000 or more. So if you're selling $50,000 of produce directly to consumers and you're making, and, and, and because you're direct sales and so forth, you're, you're not required by law. But if you're selling, all my customers require the GAP certification. It's irrele you know, irrespective of what the law, they want to be able to have that feather in their cap to say all of our growers are GAP certified. And it's not tremendously expensive. It probably be a lot of time you do the paperwork and you have the certification, you could drop one or two thousand dollars. So if you're grossing fifty thousand dollars, that's not a you know you can you can look at that and say okay that's not unreasonable. But if you're a small grower who's just selling you know to weekend kind of stuff and you're only making five or six thousand a year on it, then that's pretty pretty price prohibitive. The gap certification itself is not unreasonable. It basically is just a, a normal level of cleanliness and precautions to make sure the, 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 to protect against contamination. So, yeah. you, so you feel right now that the regulations that are being put into place in terms of record keeping and, and that sort of thing is not a huge issue for you and, and you actually think it's beneficial for society that... In general, I mean, I think some of the pesticide regulations probably go a little too far with the record keeping. But what about the water testing and... I don't really have an issue with that. I don't. Okay. I mean, I have to test water for gap certification. You know, but I, I just think about things that you hear about in the news, where you have a recall on romaine lettuce because of E. coli in the water source, or yeah. So, you, well, I mean, that's certainly something. I, I think the interesting thing is, if you go back and study it, the majority of those were from organic operations because they're using organic sources of fertility, which are mediums for bacteria to grow in. Whereas chemical fertilizers, don't, you know, E. coli is not going to grow in a bag of uh, chemical fertilizer. Now that's not a, across the board, but it is interesting if you go back and you, you know you look at that. It's quite often the case. You know, there's there's not going to be a system possible that is 100% safe. Um, and I don't know. I would love somebody to do the research relative to the population whether there's more issues now or less than there were 50 years ago. I suspect that the fact that our communications are instantaneous and so widespread, that now when something happens in California, for instance, we hear about it immediately. Whereas 50 years ago, you know, you may not have ever heard about it or you might have read it in a newspaper in the back page somewhere a week after it happened. The food was more local. It was more local, but still you had people that, that things happened. I mean, you know, we live in a, we live in a precarious world. Things, things happen and we live in with so many more people now than even 50 or 100 years ago. So you would expect the number of instances to go up proportionally when you have a much greater population. Um, so I don't know that the food safety is, I mean, you know, most, most of these regulations are centered around record keeping and documentation. So it's kind of gotten to the point in which the society of the country has said, we don't really trust you to do the right thing. We need to make you write it down. It's a little bit, a little bit uh, insulting. I well, guess. anyone can grow and start growing food. I mean, you sure. don't have to. There's no certification. There's. No, oh, that's right. No, that's right. You don't have to go to school for it. You don't have to. You can just be a farmer. You can do anything you want to do. So I think there's some point in some of that regulation, at least. Well, if you're going to, I think what they're saying is, if you're going to grow food for yourself, that's fine. If you want to sell it to your neighbors and know you directly, that's fine. 
that's the reason the FISBO rules had such a high threshold was because we really wanted to make it for people who were going to grow a lot and sell it to people away. So we needed to have that because it's hard, human nature, we still, there's still a certain level of goodness in men that say, I'm not going to look you in the eye and tell you a lie. I mean, it's, it's, most people can't do that. It, it, they're not that good of poker players, so to speak. You know, if I'm going to grow a product and I'm going to sell it to you and I know I'm going to see you at the store or I'm going to see you at church or I'm going to see you at the mall, whatever it is, I'm not like, nearly as likely to try to get away with something as if I'm going to put it on a truck and it's going to go a thousand miles away. And so that's a big, a big reason, I think, why that we've, we've had these rules come in because they want the person who's buying something from a thousand miles away to have some level of safety and feel to a certain extent as safe as a person who buys it from the neighbor. But again, you develop a relationship, you're buying in a farmer's market or you're buying it from a store that has a relationship with the grower. This the human interaction, it just negates. I mean, I'm just not gonna pour some pesticide out there to control something and tell you and tell you that, that your face that I'm not doing it. Not nearly as easily anyway. I haven't heard that take on it, that's awesome. Well, I mean, that's just my personal. No, no, I, I like the way you explain that. And I think that's what local has become very popular again because human nature, as I said, I trust somebody when I can look them in the eye or when I know it's your local. You have less trust when something was put in a box in South, uh, you know, South Mexico or even in California or, or Arizona, where it was grown and shipped here. I say that all the time. People ask me, is your farm certified organic? And I said, no, because... I know the people I'm selling to. Right. They can come by the farm, they know what I do. That's the certification that I need, not USDA organic stamp. And I, I eat everything that I grow as well. So I'm not likely to put something on there that's gonna be harmful or do something that's gonna potentially endanger my own family, much less that I go somewhere else. And I, and I think you, tend, so you also tend to have, with local and smaller growers, you have people who are doing it like you've talked earlier about you, when you talk about how much food you produce. You know, and I, when we first had the conversation, I said, that's not the point, Josh. It's, you know, it's an economic decision, but it, but it is to a certain extent, because when you're small and you're growing it, you see more than just that you're making a living. You're getting a satisfaction out of producing something, a feeling, and you know, I could have done a lot of things in my life and made way more money than I've ever made farming. I mean, I could have taken off just a regular, construction job and make more money than I've ever made farming. I enjoy farming because of what I do, which is a large part of producing food. I mean, I enjoy what I'm doing, but I get a satisfaction of what I produce. I don't think I'd be very satisfied producing widgets in the Acme factory somewhere. I don't know if people even know what that is. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> you'd have to have gone to old business school to know what those are. Or you? watch old cartoons. That's right. That's how I know about it. Yeah, Bugs Bunny was always at war with Acme. With Acme. <laughs>